All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Realizing Romans. To quote the illustrious artist Bob Ross, well, we never make mistakes, but we just make happy little accidents. <laughs> so I had a happy little accident. I brought my wrong portfolio, so I had the wrong notes. I was intending to kind of clean up and brush up the first four chapters of Romans, so we'll probably do that next time we're together. And so I guess it was meant to be because the folder that I brought actually had notes for Romans chapter 13. So we're going to jump far ahead in our lesson, and I guess maybe this is just the way God wanted it because Romans 13 has been in dispute. Churches have been trying to parse out the true meaning of Romans. And if you don't understand Romans 13 from a Messianic Jewish perspective, you will misinterpret Romans chapter 13 because you're under the assumption that it is about westernized secular government and that's the assumption and that's if that's your lens that you view Romans 13 that's the way you're going to interpret it and no wonder there was a lot of problems in the church and a lot of uh, disagreements from congregation to congregation so Romans 13 government submit to who and when all right. So basically, if you look at Romans chapter 13, you have three choices. But before we get into those three choices, we're going to pump the brakes and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word, that your word has the instructions for everything that we need in life. No matter what the subject matter is, no matter what the context is, no matter if it's first century, sixth century, 20th century, 21st century, it's all applicable. Your word is timeless, and we can take the principles found in your word and apply them to modern day scenarios. So your word is always relevant. And we thank you for what you have shown us and you've given to us through Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul. So Lord, help us as we look through Romans 13 this afternoon. Help us to know what it's trying to say to us so we can understand it and apply it to our lives, live it out, and share it with others so they can get the correct uh, and accurate context of Romans 13. Because it has torn a lot of churches over the past three years, and it's like, who who do we submit to and when? Well, you know, is it talking about what government is it talking about? So we're going to find that out. So guide us, Lord. Um, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open up our hearts and minds and make us receptive to your word. And also use my words um, for the honor and glory of Messiah Yeshua. May, you, may my words be your words. May my words not be my own, but yours, Lord. And we ask and pray these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So with the context of Romans 13, it's obviously talking about government. But which government? What government? There's different forms of government. So who do we submit to and when do we submit? So we have three choices. So the first choice is it's congregational authority. It's talking about the authority of the rabbis, the elders, the leaders, the Beit Dean, which means house of judgment, uh, that are within the synagogues and the assemblies of the first century Roma believers. Number two, um, you have the choice that is it talking about citizens and residents of the Roman Empire. Therefore, is Romans 13 talking about secular authority? That's the second choice we have. The third choice we have is, is it dealing with the, the governmental authority of autonomous Israel? Because during the Roman occupation, Israel was not autonomous. They couldn't wipe their nose without asking permission from the Roman government. They had all these rules about stoning heretics and blasphemers, but they really couldn't carry it out unless they got the approval of the Roman government. Say, yeah, go ahead, stone that guy. It's all right. If they did it on their own authority, um, their own autonomous authority, they'd get in trouble with the Roman government. So, you know, is Paul talking about an insurrection and reestablishing, uh, you know, the, the autonomous authority of Israel proper and ousting out the Romans and therefore having a theocratic rule? Um, of Israel through the Torah, because that's really the law of Israel, is the five books of Moses. Uh, it, 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 it's what God commanded the kings of Israel when they first sat on the throne, is one of their first responsibilities is to write out a copy of the five books of Moses for themselves so they can have it with them at all times and refer to it so they'll know how to lead uh, um, Israel. 
And so they had the Levitical priest and also the prophets to rely upon for interpretation, for further guidance and instruction. But the point is, Israel was ruled by the kings through the five books of Moses. That was the law of Israel. So those are the three choices we have. So looking at Romans 13 in context, I believe with all my heart that it is specifically talking about the governmental authority of the believing assemblies of Rome which is the believing synagogue. Some people will call them churches. So it's the spiritual authority is what Paul is talking about here. Now, even though it's not specifically talking about secular Roman governmental authority, nor is it talking about secular autonomous authority of Israel, those also are applicable. Just like the verse in Ruth that's quoted at weddings all the time, where Ruth said to Naomi, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. That's usually maybe part of the vows that the wife says to the husband. But that had, that, that what, what was said in Ruth had nothing to do with marriage. It was Ruth's commitment to Naomi as her mother-in-law. But, it's, but it is. It's applicable for a wedding. It's very beautiful words, and it applies. Same principle as don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I've heard all my life that, that you don't, you're not supposed to date an unsaved person if you're saved. Well, although that's true, that's not the correct context of that passage, even though it applies. The correct context of that passage is don't be a business partner with somebody who's not a believer because their scruples and your scruples aren't the same. You're going to butt heads on business practices. One's going to be, you know, not so ethical and you're going to be ethical. Mm -hmm. So even though Romans 13 is not talking about secular Roman government, nor is it talking about secular autonomous Israeli government, it's still applicable. I think the primary focus and the way that we should look at Romans 13 is the congregational authority of the Roman synagogues, the Roman uh, believing assemblies throughout the Roman Empire. And that's what's being dealt with here. So let's take these one by one. Um, let's go ahead and read the first, uh, the first verse. It says, let every person... Submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are put in place by God. All right, so it's basically saying that uh, governmental authority uh, was a creation of God. And if we look at that from a spiritual standpoint, that's true, because what happened in the wilderness? Moses was sitting there from, from morning till dusk. He was sitting there judging the people, hearing small claims arguments and small claim disputes and answering halakhic questions or questions on God's law concerning this matter, that matter, this doctrine, that doctrine. And his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, said, look, what you're doing is not good. You're going to burn yourself out and burn these people out, too. They're going to get sick of hearing you. So what I propose, and if God agrees, set this in motion. You need to pick elders, choose trustworthy, God-fearing men that cannot be bought, that cannot be bribed, and set them over the people and let them judge the people at all times. What <laughs> If they have a case or, or, or a head scratcher that's too hard for them, then let them bring it to you. And so the government authorities is set up by God, and this is what it was talking about. It's talking about, first and foremost, the Sanhedrin, the, the, the courts of Israel, which was brought down in a more localized manner within the synagogues, and these are called Beit Deans. So the Beit Din means house of judgment. So whenever something comes along within a synagogue, there's a dispute between two members. Then it's the elders that hear out the case, and they decide on what to do so they don't have to go to the secular courts. Because I think it was in James said, it's, it's a total shame for you to go to the secular courts. You're making our people and our faith look bad. If you can settle it here, settle it here. There's no need to call in the secular authorities. We have the authority of Torah to deal with any problem that we have. All right, so let's take a look at the spiritual authority. So the local authority is the rabbi and the elders which form the Beit Din. This establishes the congregation's customs and traditions based on Moses and the elders. So for that, I want to turn and reference Matthew, Matthias chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 and the first three verses of Matthew Chapter 23. So it says, Then Yeshua spoke to the crowd and to his disciples, saying, 
The Torah scholars and the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses. In other words, they are experts in the Mosaic law. They're experts on the law of the nation, which is the Torah, but also the law of the local assemblies. So they sit in the seat of Moses. So whatever they tell you, whatever they tell you, do and observe. So whatever ruling that they come down with, whether it's a halakhic ruling or a doctrinal ruling on a scripture passage, on a, on a matter of custom and tradition of the Jewish people, or whether it's a ruling dealing with a dispute that two people have, you are to obey their rulings and listen to them. And then Yeshua goes on to say, so whatever they tell you to do, do and observe, but don't do what they do. In other words, not, I don't want to paint the Pharisees all with one broad stroke because they were not all the same. The Pharisees were not the bad guys, unlike what you've been told. They were, they were some that were in the high up authority that were corrupt. And they were all about the power and the attention. But you had good Pharisees, such as Joseph of Arimathea, who gave his tomb to, to Yeshua when he died. You had Nicodemus. And both of them fought for Yeshua during the kangaroo court that Yeshua went through. But you also had the Apostle Paul, who never renounced his Phariseeism. He says, I am a Pharisee. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin. So it says, whatever they tell you to do, observe, but don't do what they do for what they say they do not do. In other words, they're being hypocritical. Rules for thee and not for me, as we've experienced over the last three years. Yeah. Uh, okay. Absolutely. All right, so uh, this is also this local authority um, establishes how the um, how the uh, congregation obeys uh, particular passages in God's word. So it establishes doctrine and it establishes halakha. That's why when you go to different churches or different congregations, they have different traditions. Doesn't mean that they're all that one's wrong and one's right, because there's more than one way to skin a cat, as the saying goes. So a perfect example, when Pam and I got married, I'll tell you about our first argument. Our first argument was over dishes. So we were washing dishes together, and Pam was washing, I was rinsing and drying. So I would rinse them, and I'd put them in the drying rack. And after we were done, I was going to walk away, and she said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm done. Well, no, you're not. That's not how you dry dishes. Why not? Well, you're supposed to get a towel and dry them and then put them back, put them up in the cupboard. Because the way she was raised, that's how her mom did it. And it was considered lazy if you didn't do it. I said, you know what? I was raised differently. I said, we put them in the drying rack and let them air dry, and then we put them away later. And I said, you have the advantage of not having lint on your, on your uh, plates. Not only that, you have to change your drying towel in the middle of drying because it gets soaking wet and you're not drying nothing. And so Pam was like, you know what? You're right. So not that one was more right than the other is there was just different ways of doing it. So when when certain churches or synagogues have certain customs and traditions, it's just their particular flavor or way of carrying out a certain aspect of God's law. And for this, I want to turn to Matthew 18 verses 18 and 20. And this is a, a lot of times you will hear this passage. And you will hear people say, this applies to spiritual warfare. This applies to exorcisms. Uh-uh. That's not what it's talking about. Is it applicable? Yes, it's still applicable. But that's not the correct context of this passage. So it says, amen, I tell you, whatever you forbid on earth has been forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will have been permitted in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything, they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. For whether two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. This is talking about establishing halakha, doctrine, customs, traditions. This is not talking about, well, I bind thee, Satan, in the name of Jesus, and I command thee to come out. And the scripture says that if we bind it on earth, it's bound to him. Is it applicable? Yeah, it's still applicable, but that's not really what he meant when he said that. Okay, so that's the other thing about spiritual authority that's being discussed here in Romans, uh, specifically verse 1. So next I want to bring out that judges, um, that this local authority, this Beit Dean, judges and settles congregational disputes. And for that, we remain in chapter 18 of Matthew, and we go up a few verses. And because we're going up a few verses, this proves that what I just said about binding and loosing are true. 
because it's in the same chapter and it's dealing with the same subject matter. Jesus is not automatically switching gears in the middle of something he's talking about and talking about some random subject. The subject flows. It goes together. So this binding and loosing is referring to the Beit Din through the, to, through the courts because verse, um, verse uh, 18, or no, verse, verse 15 of chapter 18 is talking about restoring a lost brother. So it says, now if your brother sins against you, Go and show him his fault while you post it on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> nope, that's not what it says. So we're not to air our dirty laundry as believers. So it says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault while you are with him alone. So first of all, try to resolve it in a private matter on your own. Take him to the side. And then it says, if he listens to you, if he listens to you, you have won your brother. So you don't have to go any further. You don't have to involve the elders. You don't have to involve anybody else in the matter. It's done. Verse 16, but if he does not listen, take with you one or two more. Because by two or three witnesses, let everything be established. There's not a he said, she said dynamic there. Because how many times have you know people had a disagreement and one wants to get vindictive and say, oh yeah, well when we were talking, they threatened me and told that they were going to do this and they did this to me. And there's no pr there's no way to prove it. But because, you know, this world seems to always side with the supposed victim, then they can manipulate the situation and get somebody in trouble who's really not done anything wrong. So you always want to witness, and, and it's not two or three witnesses that are your buddies or close friends. These are people that don't have a dog in the fight because you want unbiased, somebody that's not going to side with you just because they're your friend. So get people that are not involved in this dispute and bring them in. So it says, but if he does not listen, take with you one, uh, one or two more so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may stand. And that's quoting Deuteronomy verse 17. But if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to Messiah's community, get up in the middle of service and just land blast this guy, tell everybody what he did wrong so that they're shamed him and they could give them the left foot of disfellowship. No, no, so it says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to Messiah's community. I don't really like the translation, the wording here. Basically, the, the implication is here is that you bring it to the Beit Dean. You bring it to the rabbi, the pastor, if you will, and to the elders, the ruling elders, the deacons, the bishops, the ones who have authority, so that they can hear the dispute and hash it out between you two and make a final decision when the first two options didn't work. Going in private and then bringing a couple other people with them. So it says, but if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to Messiah's community. And if he refuses to listen to Messiah's community, let him be to you as a pagan or a tax collector. And all that means is you don't treat him nasty. You don't treat him bad. It just means you don't have anything to do with them. It just means that you don't go out to eat with them or buddy buddy with them or whatever. You're cordial when you see each other in public and that's it. You don't have any fellowship. So that's the other aspect of the spiritual authority that's being talked about here in Romans 13. Um, all right, so let me also read to you in conjunction with this another thing that Rob Shaul, the Apostle Paul, said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verse 1. So Paul, this is talking about settling disputes within the community, so it's good for what we're talking about here. Does any one of you... When he has a matter against his neighbor, dare go to the court before the unrighteous and not before the Kedoshim or the holy ones or the saints. Don't you know that the Kedoshim or the holy ones or the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you and you are incompetent to, be ju uh, to judge trivial matters, don't you know that we will judge angels? How much more the matters of this life? So we're to discern and settle disputes in this life to practice for the world to come. Verse 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, So if you have courts for matters of this life, why do you appoint as judges over you who have no standing in the community? In other words, why go to secular people that aren't believers and don't follow the same rules or follow the same um, uh, laws and customs and traditions that you do? It makes no sense. I say this to put you to, to shame. Isn't, 
Isn't there even one wise man among you who will be able to settle disputes between the brethren? Instead, a brother goes to court against a brother and before unbelievers at that. So imagine two people that are believers going to a secular court and they settle a matter. I bet you this is what they're thinking when the whole thing's done and they're having lunch with their other court buddies. Man, they call themselves Christians. They call themselves believers. They claim to, to worship Jesus, and yet they can't even get along. Mm. Why do I want to be a part of their faith? What is there that, that attracts me to their, to their faith? Nothing. I'm just as good as them because I can get along with, with my secular people, and they can't even get along with their own brethren. So the secular courts really have no business settling disputes between believers. That's what the church is for. That's what the synagogue is for. That's what the elders in these are for. Not just to preach and teach the word. But to, to render and make decisions. Okay, uh, moving on. Let's go ahead and go back to Romans chapter 13. And this, let's just go ahead and start it from the top again. So it says, Let every person submit himself to the gover governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are put in place by God. So whoever opposes the authority has resisted God's direction. And those who have resisted will bring judgment upon themselves. So if they walk away not adhering to what the elders of the church and or synagogue rendered, God's going to pay them back. For leaders cause no fear for good behavior, but for bad. Now, if you do not want to fear the authority, do what is good and you will get his approval. For he is God's servant to you for good. This is not talking about secular authority. Because the people that are in power in our nation, in the United States and Canada, are far removed from the Judeo-Christian principles. Our leaders used to be church-going, synagogue-going Christians and Jews and believers. Now they're atheists and secular and new age and woke and liberal. They have no business rendering judgments unto us who are believers in, in, in those kind of situations. For he is God's servant to you for your good. These secular authorities aren't God's servants. They don't even believe in God. How can they be God's servants when they diss him and they, 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 they legislate laws that totally go against what God has said in his word? They're not God's servants, so this can't be talking about secular authority. Uh, we're in verse 4. Romans. Yep, 13, 4. For he is God's servant to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not carry the sword, which the sword is symbolic of judgment. For no reason. For he is God's servant, an avenger, who inflicts punishment on the evildoer. Therefore, it is necessary to be in submission, not only because of punishment, but also because of conscience. Verse 6. Um, yeah, verse 6 and 7. For this reason you also pay taxes. Did you know that synagogues used to pay taxes to the synagogue? They not only paid taxes to the synagogue, but they paid taxes to the temple. They were, if you were a, a member of Israel, you were a Jewish person, there were certain monetary obligations you had to the temple according to the law of Moses in order to, so the sacrifices could keep being purchased, so the upkeep of the building of the temple itself can continue happening, and the same for the synagogue. If you want a nice synagogue to sit in while you hear the word of God, then you, know, you need money to keep it up. So it says, for this reason you also pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants attending diligently to this very thing. Just because the word taxes is in there, we Westerners automatically read a secular government into it. And it's not talking about secular government, even though it's still applicable to an extent, to a degree. Pay to everyone what is due them. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Now, why is he saying tribute to whom tribute is due? This goes back to where uh, Paul uh, is defending his apostolic authority when he's going to these different congregations. He says, look, don't muzzle an ox while he's treading the grain. He's quoting the Torah, but he's quoting it and making a spiritual application that a hard worker is worthy of his pay. So in other words, you know, if, if, if an apostle or a prophet comes through your congregation and speaks, he needs to be paid. Not that that's what he's there for, but he has to make a living like everybody else. 
So that's why it says pay to everyone what is due them. Tribute to whom tribute is due, tax to whom tax is due. So tribute to the, you know, the teachers and the preachers, taxes to, you know, the, the, the upkeep of the synagogue and the upkeep of the temple. Respect to whom respect is due. And if they are in a position of authority, you may not like them, but they deserve respect. And that's not contradictory. So, for instance, I'm going to kind of put it down on, on a different level here. I love mixed martial arts. I love watching UFC. Now, there are some uh, UFC fighters that I cannot stand. I don't even like to look at them. And I hope they get their block knocked off when they're in the octagon. But even though I don't like them, I respect them. Because, for instance, the Diaz brothers. The Diaz brothers, they're, they're just whiny loudmouths. But yet they have the best ground game I've ever seen in my life. They fight almost better on their back than they do standing up. And because of that, I have high, high respect for them, even though I don't like them. So you don't have to like a leader in order to respect a leader. But they deserve the respect because they paid their dues to get to where they are. And that's why it says, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. All right, so we'll just kind of break it down there. So the verses 6 and 7 we read, I want to kind of apply uh, in conjunction with Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 22. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. I hope I got this right. Hopefully I wrote it down. Okay. You know what? I, I, I may have. No, 17. See that this calcula just kicks in when it wants to. Matthew 17. That's why it wasn't reading right to me. Okay. Sorry. I, I left off the one in front of the seven. Okay. Matthew 17, verse 22. Ah, here we are. Uh. All right, now, while they were gathered in Galilee, Yeshua said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him on the third day, and he will be raised. And the disciples became greatly distressed. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax. Ah, see how this applies to Romans 13? The word tax links these two passages together. When they come to Capernaum, to collect, uh, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and said, Your teacher. Pays the temple tax, doesn't he? Yes, Peter said. Now, when Peter came into the house, Yeshua spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? The kings of the earth, from whom do they collect tolls and, or tax? From their sons or from strangers? Now, let's differentiate something here. There's two different kind of temple tax. There was one that was obligated by the Torah, that Moses said, This is what you have to pay. This is what every Israeli man has to pay. There was another temple tax that was instituted later in history that wasn't obligatory, but it was such a um, custom that if you didn't do it, you would be looked down upon. It would seem rude. So it's not like you had to, but if you didn't, it probably wouldn't look good on you. So we have these kind of customs and traditions, too, in our life where there's certain things that are expected, but they're not necessarily required. Christmas cards. Yeah, yeah, Christmas cards might be a good example, you know, and stuff like that. It's like, you know, everybody expects them, but you don't have to do it. And if you don't do it, then it kind of looks bad on right. you kind of thing. So this is the tax that's being talked about, not the one that's obligated um, by the law of Moses, by the Torah. So it says, now, when Peter came into the house, Yeshua spoke to him first, saying, who do you think, Simon, the kings of the earth, from whom do they collect tolls or tax, from their sons or from strangers? And Peter said, from strangers. Yeshua said to them, then the sons are free. So he's like, look, we're not obligated to pay this particular temple tax. But verse 27, but so as not to offend them. Hmm. Now, Yeshua, Jesus was a revolutionary. A lot of Gentile Protestant Christians paint him as some kind of rebel that was kicking and bucking against the law. No, he kept the law perfectly because if he didn't, he would be disqualified as Messiah. What he did buck against was the customs and traditions of Judaism that rubbed the Torah the wrong way, that went against the Torah or nullified the Torah. 
The greatest example is when he said, look, you, you, you nullify the Torah when, when, you, uh, when your men say, oh, I'm sorry, mom and dad. I know the law tells me to support you in your old age, but korban, korban, which means everything that I have is now dedicated to the temple. You're not honoring your father and mother by giving what, is, what they need to the temple. God doesn't need your money. So that's what, that's what Yeshua bucked up against. But even there were some customs and traditions that he kept because he knew, he knew it was good PR and he knew it was just good politeness. So he said, but so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw out a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. Take that and give it to them for me and for you. All right. So also in conjunction with what we're talking about, let's refer to another of Paul's letters. We may have to break this up into two parts. I'm not sure. Okay, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, beginning with verse 17. Now, remember when, uh, you know, honor who honor is due, respect to whom respect is due, tribute to whom tribute is due, tax to whom tax is due. Well, in 1 Timothy 5, beginning with verse 17, it says, The elders who lead well are worthy of honor and honorarium especially those who work hard in the word and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is threshing, and the worker is worthy of his wages. So this is the things that are talking. Hey, can you shut the door, please? Yes. We're, uh, it's too noisy. Thank you. All right. Also another uh, comment from the Apostle Paul from the letter of uh, 1 Corinthians. See, when you do a Bible study with me, man, you're flipping pages like nobody's business. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So if you just want to listen and I go too fast for you, that's fine too. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Does any one of you, when he has a matter against his neighbor, dare... Oh, I've already read that. Okay, never mind. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 9. A few pages over. Let's read the first 12 verses. Am I not free? Am I not an emissary that is an apostle? Have I not seen Yeshua our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? Uh, if, if, to others, if to others I am not an emissary that is an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of, of my office of apostle slash emissary in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Don't we have the right to food and drink? So, you know, this is, this is a big misconception with ministry. I know that TV evangelists and certain TV celebrities who have big old mansions out in the middle of nowhere and have armed guards all the time, they've given true ministers of God a bad name. I'm not getting rich off of what I'm doing. I'm putting food on the table and I'm paying some of my bills, but I'm not making money hand over fist. And that's not why I do it anyway. But yet, because that is my occupation, because that is what I do to make a living, I deserve to, to be paid. And even the Apostle Paul says that. He's like, look, I deserve to have my bread and butter. And this is how I make my bread and butter. Now, there were some rabbis and some teachers who had another occupation. So let's say that they were, they were a scribe. They made money as a scribe. Or... Uh, they made money making talits. The Apostle Paul, one of his occupations was a tent maker, quote unquote. Now, a tent maker is just the slang or Jewish idiom for a prayer shawl, for a talit. So he knew all the rabbinical rules that were um, involved in making a prayer shawl, a proper prayer shawl. So he had that occupation, but he couldn't always, when he was doing the missionary journeys, he couldn't do this prayer shawl thing. Only when he was settled and in certain places could he rely on that for an income. Other than that, he had to, uh, um, you know, depend on the income of what the congregations donated when he went on these missionary journeys. So this is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, all right, so verse 4, we left off. Do we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take along believing wives, as do other emissaries? In other words, our family travels with us. And the Lord's brother and Peter, Kepha. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no rights to the work? See, Paul, there's a couple passages where he said, look, I know your congregation is kind of hard up. 
And so we kind of did work on the side to earn our keep because we didn't want to burden you to give to us. But because they did that, it's kind of like they set a precedent to where, oh, well, we don't have to, we don't have to pay Paul and Barnabas. You know, they, they you know, so he's kind of setting them straight here. I who have no right, uh, have no right to not work. What soldier ever served at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruits? Or who tends a flock and does not drink its milk? I do not say these things merely as a man, do I? Doesn't the Torah also say these things? For it is written in the Torah of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it's threshing. This is twice he quoted this. Once, I think, to Timothy, was it? And here in uh, 1 Corinthians. Um, is it the ox that, uh, that concerns God? Or is he speaking entirely for our sake? Yes, it was written for our sake, because one plowing ought to plow in hope, and the one threshing in hope of sharing the crop. If we sowed spiritual things into you, it is so much if we reap material things from you. Or is it so much that we reap material things from you? So he says, my spiritual service is worthy of monetary compensation. Because again, that's, it's not to get rich. That's just how we make our bread and butter. If others have a share in this claim over you, shouldn't we even more? All right. So the last point under this spiritual authority in regards to Romans 13 is... Um, if religious authorities get woke and stray, then don't then don't listen to them. So Acts it says in the uh, book of Acts, chapter five, so if religious authorities kind of get power hungry and they get hypocritical and they get woke or they stray, we get a little guidance here in Acts chapter five verse twenty seven. When they had brought them, they placed them before the Sanhedrin. Okay, so the Sanhedrin was God's ordained court since the time of Moses. And Jesus himself even said, those who sit in the seat of Moses, obey them. Obey the rendering of their verdicts and decisions. But here it says, when they had brought them, when they, had brought them they placed them before the Sanhedrin. The Kohen Gadol, or the high priest, questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings, and, you're, and you intended to bring, us, um, bring on us the blood of this man. Peter and the apostles, the emissaries, replied, we must obey God rather than man. So whenever the religious authorities go against the word of God itself, that's the only time you're allowed to buck up against that. I've had to do that a couple times in my life, and I, I didn't do it with pleasure. I didn't like doing it, but it was necessary. Uh, all right, so Peter and the emissaries replied, we must obey God rather than man. Okay, so has it, let's go back to uh, Romans 13, our, our focus text. So is it pretty clear thus far that Romans 13 is not about secular authority? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay, so let's deal with the application, though, of those other interpretations. So like I said, they're applicable to secular authority and autonomous Israeli secular authority only to an extent, only to a, a degree. Because the main purpose, main focus, main context was the spiritual authority of the assemblies of the believing Roman congregations. That's what Romans 13 is. That's the government to submit to and to who and when. So let's see if we can make some applications to um, a secular, secular authority. Let's start with the secular authority under the theocratic rule of Torah. So this is Israel and her kings. All right. So Romans uh, 13, 1 again says, let every person submit himself to the governing authorities. So is it applicable to autonomous Israel? Well, yeah, to, a, to an extent, because it says in Deuteronomy... Chapter 17, Deuteronomy chapter 17, and I think I kind of brought this out earlier. So Deuteronomy 17, starting with verse 8. Suppose a matter arises that is too hard for you. So this is Jethro, Moses' uh, father-in-law, who basically just converted. Um, he sees Moses teaching and preaching, uh, guiding Israel, sitting as a judge morning till night. He says, suppose a matter arises that is too hard for you to judge over bloodshed, legal claims, or assault, matters of controversy within, within your gates. 
Then you should go up to the place your God chooses and come to the Levitical Kohanim and the judges in charge at that time. So not only is the Sanhedrin involved, but the priests are involved, and a lot of the Sanhedrin was made up of priests. And you will inquire, and they will tell you the sentence of judgment. You are to act according to the sentence they tell you from that place Adonai chooses, and take care to do all they instruct you. You are to act according to the instructions they teach you and the judgment they tell you. You must not turn aside from the sentence they tell you to the right or to the left. Oh, because you're not a secular authority that can put me in prison. I really don't have to listen to you because what consequence am I going to deal with? You're going to, con you're going to deal with the consequence of God, buddy. I don't want to be in the hands of an angry God because I disrespected his authority. Even David himself respected the authority that was placed over Israel's secular government that he wouldn't even touch Paul, uh, touch Saul, even though Saul was off his rocker, even though Saul was backslid, even though Saul was not in the right place. He said, I'm not going to touch God's anointed. If God wants him out of power, God's going to take him out of power and put me in power instead. I'm not going to deal with this. So he had twice, he had two opportunities to kill Saul and he didn't because he respected the anointing. He may not have liked Saul, but he respected his authority. So you are to act according to the sentence they tell you from the place Adonai chooses and take care to do all. Okay, I already read that. Verse 12, the man who acts presumptuously, not listening to the Kohen, the priest, who stands to serve there before Adonai your God or to judge that man must die. So you say that he can't do anything to you? Well, he can give you a death sentence if you're caught. So you are to purge the evil from Israel. Then all the people will hear and be afraid and not act presumptuously again. So, you know, it's interesting that there is no prison system in Israel, in the Israeli government of the biblical times. There was a temporary holding because okay, we're going to just kind of lock you up until we know what God wants us to do with you. Most of the time, you either had to pay a fine or you were put to death. That was pretty much it. So those two things were enough deterrent that it kept people on, on the straight and narrow. And we see what has happened in our secular society as we've done away with the death penalty. You barely even get a slap on the wrist. So what? You serve a couple years. You learn how to be a better criminal. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, okay, so I'm going to – I was going to read all the way to um, verse 20, but basically uh, verse 20 we already kind of covered. It's when a king comes to the throne, he knows he's going to have to rule Israel, and the law of Israel is the five books of Moses. So he's supposed to write out a copy for himself. All right, so uh, that's dealing with kind of the secular authority, uh, the uh, secular Israeli authority. All right, so uh, in Romans chapter 13 – or, yeah, 13. We're going to go back to verse 8. So 8 through 13. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the Torah. So what this is saying is that love isn't the rule that does away with the 613 commandments. It says if you're going to follow the 613 commandments, the motivation needs to be out of love. That's the way to keep the commandments because anybody can keep the commandments. It's easy for me not to put a knife in somebody's back, but it's really hard for me not to put a knife in their back in my head, in my heart. So that's what's – so, you know, love. If I love somebody, I'm not going to want to stab them in the back, in my mind, in my heart. So, O oh man, no man anything except to love one another, for one who loves one another has fulfilled the Torah. So law is the, or the love is the basis for fulfilling God's commandments. Verse 9, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If I love my neighbor as myself, I'm not going to want to jump in bed with his wife. I'm not going to want to slash his tires. I'm not going to want to beat his skull in. I'm not going to want to take his RV that I think is super cool <laughs> and hot. You know, so if I love them, I'm not going to want to do anything against him. So you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fullness of the Torah. Uh, beside this, you know the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when it than we first came to trust. 
Uh, the might is almost gone, or the night is almost gone, and the day is near. So let us put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, nor in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and envy. Instead, put on the Lord Messiah Yeshua and stop making provisions for the flesh, for its cravings. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's go to, all right, yeah, all right, we read all that. Just trying to get my bearings here. All right, uh, Romans 13, verse 2. So whoever opposes the authority has resisted God's direction, and those who have resisted will bring judgment on themselves. So again, now we're taking it from the applicability of the autonomous Israeli government based on the theocratic rule of the, of the Torah. So from, Le from Levitical priesthood to Sanhedrin to rabbinical Beit Deans, uh, God ordained priest, kings, and judges. All right, uh, verses. All right, verses eight through ten. Let's see what we got here. All right, so we already read that. All right, obedience to God's law and ordained authorities is to be out of a uh, motivation of love. So again. I like to take the 613 commandments of the Torah and put it in a mathematical equation. So what is 6 plus 1 plus 3? 6 plus 1 plus 3. 10. So the 10 commandments sum up the 613. The 10 commandments are a summary of the 613. So you got 10 commandments. What's 1 plus 0? 1 plus 0. 1. Yeah, 1 plus 0 is 1. So... Okay, we're, we're not talking about that. So, yes. one, one plus zero is one. So, you have one law that sums up the ten. That ten sums up the 613. That one law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, or it's the same as the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, love is the motivation of keeping God's law. All right? So, practicing kingdom law here uh, prepares us for the kingdom law in the millennium. So when the new heaven and the new earth come and Yeshua is reigning on the throne in the temple in Israel, guess what law he's going to go by? The five books of Moses. And you're like, well, I'm not so sure about that. Well, then why in Zechariah does it talk about the millennium that if the secular Gentile nations doesn't celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and bring the appropriate offerings, they're not going to get rain for their harvest. So the millennial kingdom is going to be a Torah observant kingdom. <laughs> That's the kingdom law. That's the why the Mosaic law was written was to be the law for Israel because that's what the kings ruled Israel by because they copied it for themselves. So we see that Romans 13 is specifically dealing with the government authorities of the local assemblies. But it could equally be as applicable to the Israeli government ruled by a king of Israel who is going by the Torah, the theocratic rule of Torah. All right. Um, okay. Now, so this is, this is the thing that was the trouble during the, um, during the last three years, we'll say, because I try to speak in code. I don't want this stuff to get flagged if it doesn't have to be. So the secular authority, this is the thing the churches were all upended about. And really it was a non-issue because Romans 13 is not about a secular authority, even though you can make applications from Romans 13 to secular authority. That's not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the spiritual authority of the local assemblies from the rabbis, the pastors, if you will, and the bait deans, the, the elders. So the, the secular, um, we, we, can, we can make applications in this way So with Romans 13. We know that Canada in the United States was originally founded on Judeo-Christian principles. In other words, they basically went by the five books of Moses to set up their, our society. Today, we have gone far from that. And we no longer have just judges. We can no longer rely or depend on the justice or criminal system because it is corrupt. It is broken. So um, basically, the five books of Moses is the basic foundation of Judeo-Christian morality and ethics, which were applied in the beginning to the United States and Canada. Uh, they are supposed to be God's arm of justice in the secular world. 
So at one time, you could say that the secular government were God's servants because most uh, politicians and rulers and judges and governors went to church. Whether they were Christian or not, they went to church and they followed the moral code of the Judeo-Christian values and faith. That is no longer the case today. So they are so basically the secular government is accountable to God and the people. Uh, and then when they attempt to enforce unjust laws, you can revolt righteously. So we are finding unjust laws being made. For instance, we can get in trouble for misgendering somebody. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to lie to the person. If they were born a, a, a particular biological gender, I'm going to call them that regardless of what they want to be called because I'm not going to go with their, their delusion. I'm not going to go with their lie or what we call their truth. I'm going to go with the truth of how they were born and what God says is male and female. I'm not, and so if I get fined, if I get jailed, then so be it. It's an unjust law that I'm not going to follow because if I did, I would be complicit in that falsehood. I would be complicit in that agenda. I would be complicit in that lie. So if there's unjust laws or unjust rulings, then if it goes against the word of God, then you can go against it. Then you can revolt in a righteous way. And a lot of us revolted over the past three years over unjust things that they were trying to pass in our congregations. Where's the, where's the separation of church and state then? It didn't apply then, did it? So we know in an, another unjust law, we've seen Pastor Pulowski and Pastor Coates during the past three years get put in prison and arrested because they wouldn't go along with the agenda. We also seen El Isabella of the UK who got convicted for an Orwellian crime, a thought crime. Who would ever thought we'd live in the day where we can get arrested for what we think? But she had her head bowed in public in front of an abortion clinic. What are you doing? I might be praying to God. Well, you're under arrest and we're going to charge you with some four counts of whatever. Really? We've come to that. So are those unjust laws that you can revolt against? Because it goes against the word of God. So we can see that Romans 13 isn't really addressing secular authority. It's not really even addressing the secular authority of autonomous Israel, even though there's some applications we can make that we've already dealt with. It's specifically dealing with the governmental authority of the local assembly, of the, the, the rights that the leaders have as rabbis, pastors, deacons, bishops, elders, to be able to rule on any matter of doctrine, tradition, or dispute that uh, 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 believers have with each other within the congregation. Uh, okay. All right. I think we covered Romans 13. So is, 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 was that clear as mud? Does that really straighten up what Romans 13 is about? So yeah, it's clear. I feel like I missed like 45 minutes. I want to like go over it again. It's <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna upload it, and then uh, you can you can listen to it online. So uh, yeah. All right. So now, when everybody when when a Christian comes against you, says, "Oh, you can't be doing that because Romans 13 is that you can't go against the government." Uh, well, no, that's not really what it says. And you can explain to them what Romans 13 in context is really all about, even though it's applicable, can make some certain applications to an extent to secular authority. It's specifically talking about the spiritual authority. Of the, of the congregations within the Roman Empire. All right, so let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the clarity that you have provided for us and given us on Romans 13 and what Romans 13 really means on who to submit to and when. So we know what it means now. So we thank you and we praise you for that. So help us to assimilate it, digest it, make it a part of us, and be able to relay this to other people who have this mistaken notion that Romans 13 is talking about secular government. It's not. It's not. You can make certain applications, but it's not. Contextually, literally, it's dealing with the authority of the uh, believing Roman congregations in the empire. And uh, so we can make these same applications to our local assemblies here in Plaster Rock. And Lord, we love you and we praise you, and we ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.